Okay, recording has begun. Uh, thanks everyone um, for joining us. This is the online MCS MCSDS admissions webinar for international students. Um, we could go ahead and do a quick round of introductions and then uh, go through the slide deck. I'll be sharing my screen with everybody. Um, and then after that, we'll have some time for Q&A. We do ask that you put your questions in the Q&A forum versus the chat box, please. Um, so if let's go ahead and start with some introductions. John and Vivica, if you want to go first. Sure. Um, hi, I'm John Hart. I'm a professor of computer science here at the University of Illinois in the Department of Computer Science and also the director of online and professional programs for the Department of Computer Science. Hello everyone, I'm Viveka Kudlikama. I'm the coordinator for computer science graduate programs. And I, we should also add that Professor Hart is also an executive dean at the graduate college here at, um, <laughs> at Illinois. Yeah, but I'm not here in that capacity. Right. Thank you. And Christine? Uh, my name is Christine Martinez. I'm an academic advisor um, with the online MCS MCSDS. Yeah, it looks yeah. like we have Desiree also. Mm -hmm. Yep, Desiree. Ah. Hi, I'm Desiree. I'm also one of the academic advisors um, for the online program. Great, thank you. Okay, so John, if you're good, we can just jump into the slide deck. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, very good. I'll go ahead and just advance us to the next slide. There we go. Okay, well, welcome. You've been uh, admitted now into the Master of Computer Science program at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. We're well known in computer science. It's a uh, program ranked in the top five by US News and World Report. Um, and we've been offering the MCS degree uh, uh, for decades. And in fact, we've offered it online for several decades. Uh, we've been offering um, courses and educational opportunity at the University of Illinois online since the 60s. We were one of the first to do online education with the Plato system uh, back then, and we continue to find new ways to uh, offer uh, the educational opportunity um, online in, in new and innovative ways. So this Master of Computer Science degree, we're offering it online, but it's the same degree we offer on campus and we've been offering for, for decades. Um, the background that we're looking for it is uh, it's a professional degree, so uh, it's a very multidisciplinary degree. We don't just get computer scientists with a computer science bachelor's degree um, getting a computer science master's degree as a master of computer science. We also see people from other disciplines, um, people that majored in other fields uh, for their bachelor's degree, adding a master of computer science degree on top of that, almost like you would add an MBA on top of another uh, uh, disciplinary degree. Um, it's multifunction. You'll be learning um, computer science across uh, at least four different breadth areas of computer science, um, and it will involve programming. It's um, We offer the Master of Computer Science and the Master of Computer Science and Data Science. Uh, the Master of Computer Science and Data Science is the same Master of Computer Science degree, but you complete it by finishing uh, data science um, uh, uh, you, you complete this by, uh, uh, you complete the MCS degree um, as the MCSDS by completing data science uh, um, uh, uh, coursework. So uh, as Vivica reminds me, this is for students that are applying internationally, not that have been admitted. So um, you, haven't, you haven't been admitted yet. So uh, just my saying so did not automatically admit 500 <laughs> students into the program. I wish I could do that, but... Uh, um, so let me give you some information about what to put into the application packet. Um, uh, uh, everybody that applies for this degree needs to have a bachelor's degree. Um, so we will, we will be looking for your bachelor's degree. And let us know if you don't have a bachelor's degree, but that's, um, that's a requirement of the program. And, um, so we'll be looking for a bachelor's degree. But the bachelor's degree does not have to be in computer science. It can be in... Um, uh, it can be in any other field. We have uh, students in our program that have their bachelor's degree in some other area of engineering or some other area of science, like physics or chemistry, um, you know, um, or uh, you know, mechanical engineering or industrial engineering. We have students that have bachelor's degrees in physics and, and, and uh, in uh, 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 in English and in psych psychology. Um, 
uh, in a wide variety of other areas that are adding this Master of Computer Science on top of their degree to be able to do computational science in their particular area that they have their bachelor's degree in. Uh, and that can be computational science, it can be computational humanities, it can be a wide variety of uh, things. It can be in the arts. And we already have uh, bachelor's degrees in combined CS plus music and CS plus other areas. And so you can also add a master's of computer science on top of a degree in music or, or, uh, or the fine arts or any number of other areas. But uh, we expect the students applying for the program to have a bachelor's degree. Um, and also, uh, students will need to have a GPA of uh, 3.2 or higher. And that GPA, officially, it's in the last two years of your coursework. We'll also be looking for your GPA in your computing classes um, to see if that's 3.2 or higher. Um, if your GPA is lower, then you can also take um, additional courses, say at a community college or other, um, um, other local um, teaching institutions. And we'll be, we'll be considering those courses as more recent, especially if you, if you completed your degree um, several years ago or, or you know, a decade or more ago. Um, having more recent coursework, we will use that more recent coursework uh, to, to look at your GPA. In general, we, uh, we look at applications holistically and we try to look at every, uh, everything you provide to us in, in finding uh, um, uh, in making our determination for admission. And so you have to have a bachelor's degree, you have to have a GPA of 3.2 or higher in, you know, uh, in some way of looking at your GPA that shows it to be 3.2 or higher. And then the third thing you need to have is the prerequisite knowledge to get through our graduate courses in computer science. And that means you have to have uh, abilities for programming. You have to know data structures, algorithms, and object-oriented design. Um, and we'll be looking for those on the application forms. Um, there will be check boxes for each of these to make sure you've got data structures, algorithms, and object-oriented design. And then um, the best way to fulfill those uh, requirements is to, is to type the, uh, the name and the number of the course that you took and the semester you completed the course and what grade you got into the little text box next to that box. And that tells us where to look at on your uh, transcript to ensure that you've taken a course in data structures, algorithms, and object-oriented design. So many students have a first course in computer science and programming, usually it's in Python programming or some other interpreted language. We're usually looking for a second course and that's where you get the data structures and other algorithmic analysis and object-oriented design. So we're specifically looking for that second course, especially when you check the data structures box. Um, so please be sure to list those courses in the corresponding box. You could have the same course count for algorithms and object-oriented design but typically we're looking for at least two courses in computer science for the prerequisites. So if you can make sure you've got two courses uh, in, in uh, computer science um, already uh, indicated uh, in, in the uh, application form. Um, most students will come in knowing Python or MATLAB or some other interpreted language, maybe R. Um, we'll be teaching um, uh, many of our courses using production programming languages like C++ or Java. And so it's not a requirement to know C++ or Java, but it's a good opportunity for you to pick up one of those production programming languages if you're not familiar with them already. And to be able to use a compiler and a linker and so on. We'll also be looking for linear algebra and some coursework or past experience working with uh, statistics and probability. Um, uh, we've got uh, a lot of uh, uh, coursework that relies on machine learning or applications of machine learning uh, including uh, data mining and, and many other fields, and those will rely on statistics and probability. We also have graduate coursework in statistics and probability that can be used for part of the program. Uh, next slide, Christine. Great. Uh, Vivica, you want to talk about the application requirements? I can certainly do that. So, so these are the logistics of applying, actually, of submitting an application without which we cannot actually evaluate your credentials for um, acceptance into the program. So this is um, the session for international students. The application fee is um, $90 for international students that is paid at the end of submitting your application. One thing we do want to remind applicants is there is one stage in this process where you submit your application and then it takes you to another screen that asks, that gives the payment option. Please be sure to um, 
make that complete that step where you actually pay the application fee because the department is unfortunately unable to review the applications until that stage is completed. Um, you can, it is possible to click out of that screen. We recommend that you do not do that, but complete this, complete this second step of making the payment. Okay, so that's just generally. So what do we need in the application? Um, I'm going to leave the letters of recommendation to the last. Okay. Um, there is there's, there's information that you will include based on your um, based on your bio data and your past academic experiences. What we do want you to do is, if you have attended multiple schools, even if you have not received a degree, please do make sure that you include all the institutions. If you just took some classes, it could be a non-degree option, but um, do make a note because we do want to see your full academic history and that at the end of the application, you also attest that you have provided us a full complete history of your own educational record. There is, there's an option to include a statement of purpose. There are no set um, formatting requirements. There's no length requirements. So this is something at your discretion. Typically, we would not see three to four pages of statements of statements of purpose. This could be a one page or less document that you um, provide us. There is, there is a um, CV or a resume. And we do ask that you provide us a full CV or a resume because this gives us information, additional information that allows the um, faculty members to look at your application and make a good um, evaluation. Um, so this, this would include your um, academic history. And if you are going to be um, seeking a waiver from the language requirements, it is really critical that you tell us where you were employed. So for example, if you were employed at Microsoft, please tell us where you were, which location you were at, because that will hinge, uh, that, that will um, affect whether you are eligible for, um, for waivers or not. Then the transcripts. Transcripts are perhaps one of the most important pieces of your application. These are unofficial transcripts. Uh, we do not need the official transcripts at this stage, but we do need to see all the classes that you have taken, including the, the class titles, as well as the grades that were awarded to these classes. So it's an institution and all the classes you have taken at each institution. The second part of transcripts is, we would want you to upload a copy of the grading scale at your home institution. So grading scale could be found on the back of the transcript pages. For example, if you've attended um, institutions in the US, those uh, grading scales would be at the back of the page. Some other overseas institutions, international institutions might have this grading scale at the very end of the transcript. But typically there is some notation of what a grade means, what the scale means, and that that information has to be provided. This is something that we sometimes see is missing in the applications, and this, this becomes then a um, challenge for us to evaluate your applications. Also, when you copy the transcripts, when you scan them, please reopen them and make sure that you can actually read them. If you can't read them, neither could we, and we, we would need to either contact you to say that we can't read the applications, which delays the review process. So it's in your best advantage to make sure the transcripts are um, legible, clean, and um, complete. So at the time of application, it's only an unofficial transcript, but suppose you were admitted to the degree program, then the graduate college requires official transcripts. So we are giving this ahead of time. If you think that your home institutions might take three months to get you an official copy of the transcript. Um, you would want to plan for that timeline either now or as soon as you're admitted. Official transcripts can either be sent directly to the institute, to the university, to the graduate college, or you can ask them to be sent to you in a sealed and signed envelope. If you get it 
sent to you, please do not open those signed and sealed envelopes, but just hold on to them. Because once they are opened, then they are no longer official transcripts. Um, Christine, am I missing anything on the transcripts? So let me then, uh, John. Yeah, let me jump in on some of the other things. So. Um, the letters of recommendation and a statement of purpose. If you include those, we will look at them, but they are certainly not required for your uh, application. What we're going to be looking at primarily in the applications are your transcripts, your uh, which will tell us your uh, bachelor's degree information and your uh, GPA and, and the, the classes that you've taken. Um, so that's primarily what we'll be looking at. Um, if, you, uh, if you're missing some prerequisites and you want us to consider your work experience, then you should be very detailed in your uh, resume um, of what that work experience is. And if the, in the letters of recommendation, you can have um, a manager or somebody that was overseeing your work speak specifically about the details of data structures and computer science, object oriented design algorithms and so on that you did in that work performance, you can include that. Um, typically, uh, that's not enough to justify uh, admissions, and so we have some other options that, uh, that are better um, to, to fulfill some missing prerequisites, but we will take a look at everything you sent to us. Also, uh, you're welcome to include GRE or other uh, test uh, results, but we do not require GRE results for the, for the program. Okay. So let me then pick up on the TOEFL course since we are yeah. talking to international applicants potentially mm -hmm. um, the if broadly all international students have to submit either TOEFL scores or IELTS scores and you can see the requirements on this screen for um, TOEFL it's a 103 or higher total scores and IELTS is it's above 7.0. So this, um, there's a slight revision on this. It should be seven point, above 7.0. Um, and they have to be less than two years old. So for example, two years old from the time you're going to start the program. So if you're applying, for example, for summer of 2019, which um, most of you probably would be, we start classes in mid-May, so you could, if you have taken either TOEFL or IELTS sometime after mid-May 2017, your scores would be still valid. Um, count, count back two years from the time you plan to um, start the degree program. That's what it is. So, and I, I started this thing, this is a general, broadly, broad overhead of um, TOEFL and IELTS requirements. There are some exceptions to this requirement based on what, <clears throat> sorry, what you have done in the past. There are some ex exceptions at the graduate college. For example, let's say you might be an international student, but you may have gone to school in one of the eligible countries. So US is one. Um, there are some other countries that we can um, point you to. If you have completed either two years of post-secondary education, or if you have earned a degree from one of these countries within the past five years, then you do not have to submit new scores again, even if you're an international student. So that's based on your academic record. And then there's also another, another option based on your employment record. If you have worked in one of the um, eligible countries for two years, um, starting now, working back, then you can ask for an exemption. And this is why on the resume, we ask that you list where you actually worked. That, that allows us to see whether you might be eligible for an exemption. And if we see that, and if you're admitted, then we will take that into consideration. If you're admitted and we cannot see the scores or if we cannot determine from your resume, then we will be in touch with you that we can we need additional information. Um, there are also some countries that are just exempt if you are a um, national of that, of that country. You can go to our graduate college and if you, in the search function, if you just type in your country, your home country and um, TOEFL, it should take you to the requirements of each country. So that's, that's a good place where you can check. We will also, um, 
Christine, maybe you can put in the link to the graduate college on the chat space. So yes, and, and the link is included in the last slide also, last slide. so I can do Thank that. You. So, th so there are a couple of places that you can check whether you're eligible for an exemption or not. If you are not sure, um, please email us and that email will also be shared later and one of the advisors can confirm or verify for you. I think we can move from this slide, Christine. Okay. Okay, so the next slide goes over tuition and financial aid. Um, John or Vivica, would you like to speak to that? Sure. Um, let me talk about tuition. Uh, the tuition is currently uh, $600 per credit hour. That'll be about $2,400 per course for eight courses required by the program, uh, which totals $19,200. Uh, but in addition to the tuition, there are MOOC fees that we have to charge for the um, uh, yeah, but we'll get, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, uh, that we would charge, that bring that up, um, that adds another $178 per course. We will be changing the tuition rate um, starting fall 2019, um, and this is all pending approval, but if approved, um, we'll be increasing the, uh, uh, the tuition um, uh, to a rate that allows us to remove those MOOC fees. So, the total amount of the degree when you add in tuition and um, uh, also uh, proctor due uh, fees for um, proctoring exams. We make sure that all our exams are proctored with the, uh, the online proctoring service to make sure all the students are graded fairly, um, plus any books and anything else you might need. The total comes up to about $21,000, $22,000 for the cost of the degree. So just wanna make sure we got the, the total amount uh, that was there. Um, and you will be billed for tuition and you will be paying tuition by the credit hour um, at the time you take your classes. So that's different than students on campus, which pay a range of tuition. Um, on campus, uh, students have to, same, have to pay the same tuition regardless of how many classes they're taking if it falls within a certain range. Um, whereas you, um, as, a, uh, as a student in this online program, have the luxury to pay only for the courses you're taking. So um, uh, if you take one course, you'll be paying um, tuition for that one course. If you take two courses, you'll be paying tuition for that uh, for both courses. But if you need a semester off, um, something comes up at work or a family obligation or some other life event happens, you need that semester off, just let us know. And you can take that semester off and you don't have to pay anything. If you're an on-campus student, you would still have to pay for that semester. Um, but as an online student in this program, the way we set up the uh, tuition is that if you need the semester off, you take the semester off, you don't have to pay a thing. The only thing is we ask that you let us know so we can make sure all the students are, um, are make, we make sure all the students are making progress through the, through the program and, and um, uh, everybody can complete the degree. Uh, anything you want to say about financial aid? So financial aid, this, this degree program is, um, is um, an accredited degree program offered on the on our campus. So it's if you are, I'm not sure how how relevant this would be for international students. So if your if your home countries have certain types of financial aid programs and those are subject to um, accredited programs, then certainly this is a program that would fulfill that requirement. So we would ask you to explore options available to you and other uh, private lending op opportunities that you might have. What is what's, what you should know is that you do not have to uh, pay the full full cost upfront. You you pay for the classes that you take each semester. So if I take one class per semester, I would be then billed um, at the six hundred dollar rate. $2,400 for that particular semester only. Um, if you're trying to plan for financial resources, there is also an option where you can sign up for a payment plan and you can pay in installments over that semester. So it, this takes a little bit of planning ahead of time because if you sign up early, you have more, in, more installment payments compared to signing up late because you will be making the full payment by the end of the semester. 
for those of you who might be supported by employees or even other uh, your home country agencies, there is a way for those uh, sponsors to be directly billed so that you do not have to pay and be reimbursed, but you can set this up for the third party, third party billing uh, process so that the university directly bills your sponsor and the payments go through that. So if you have questions regarding these, we will have those links and we can also help you um, direct to the right campus offices. So there are, there are options to work through the financial needs in this program. Yep. And just, just to be perfectly clear also, the department, uh, and we, we, we do not have any scholarships available for this program. Um, there aren't any assistantships or TA ships or anything like that that we have available for students in this program. It's really um, uh, designed in a way that provides educational opportunity through a, a uh, greatly reduced tuition rate. But as a result of that, we don't have, um, have other funding uh, options available for students in the program. So, um, uh, but it, uh, so students in the program are expected to either pay tuition or find um, other options for uh, funding their tuition, but um, also the tuition rate is, is lower than um, the tuition rate we can offer any of our other students um, in any of our other programs. So it's a great bargain, but um, um, it is a tuition funded program. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so next we're coming up to a list of FAQs um, that, we've, that we see most often. Um, so I know, John and Vivek, if we just want to go through the list and just address them. Um, you know, that why don't you way. ask each of the questions and then we can uh, answer them. Okay, perfect. So um, first question, what is online MCS? Great. So the online MCS is the online offering of the Master of Computer Science. We've been offering the Master of Computer Science online since the 90s. Um, it's a very well-established degree. It's a professional degree in computer science. So a master's, the, the, the MCS is, a, is what's known as a professional degree. It's coursework only. It only consists of eight courses. You don't have to write a thesis or uh, defend anything uh, in, in, or do research as part of the degree. The degree is really based on doing advanced coursework at the graduate level in computer science. And that sets you up for professional practice. Um, if you want to become a software developer, if you want to uh, uh, you know, launch your own company in, in, um, in, some, in one of the computing fields, this is a great course that gives you the advanced computer science knowledge necessary to do that. Um, but it's not designed for research. So it's not, not the most appropriate degree to use if, for example, you want to go on for a PhD in computer science. Um, uh, for a PhD in computer science, you would tend to want to publish papers and, and do a thesis, and you might want to look at the MS program, the Master of Science in Computer Science. But that's, um, that program is available on campus only, um, and, um, and the tuition for that is significantly higher. Um, but the, the MCS is designed uh, for, for students that want a degree to, to move, do more advanced work just in computer science. Um, and then the MCSDS, I'll skip to the next question, uh, uh, Christine. Um, the MCSDS is, um, is that same degree, that Master of Computer Science, but you complete the degree using coursework in data science. And so we've got a curriculum of coursework that satisfies the Master of Computer Science degree but does so using coursework from data science, specifically in machine learning, data mining, cloud computing, and data visualization. And so um, you'll be getting the exact same degree, that Master of Computer Science degree, but you can indicate MCSDS on your resume, on LinkedIn, and any place else um, to indicate that you, you have not only a, a computer science master's degree, but one that's specialized in data science. Uh, let me also mention that that Master of Computer Science degree you get will be conferred by the University of Illinois. It will not indicate whether it was online or on campus. You get the same Master of Computer Science degree that meets the same requirements for that degree, regardless of whether you're taking it online or on campus. All of the courses we offer in this program meet the same requirements, whether we offer them on campus or online. We've been doing this for a long time, and we know how to make sure that we structure these uh, um, uh, these offerings of these courses to make sure that they uh, that they have equivalent uh, um, commensurate credit. 
Um, and also the MCS degree you get will just say Master of Computer Science. It won't indicate whether it's a specialization in data science anywhere on your transcript or the degree. You get the same Master of Computer Science students before you've been getting for decades. Uh, but you can indicate um, on your resume or LinkedIn that it specialized in data science. Uh, so that's the third bullet. Sorry, I'm, I'm moving quite a bit. <laughs> No, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so next question. How is an online M how is the online MCS offered using Coursera uh, MOOC platform? Good question. So the University of Illinois does not confer university credit for a, a MOOC. Um, if you're on Coursera and you're taking one of the open enrollment MOOCs, say in one of our specialization sequences in cloud computing or data mining, that's great. What you're doing when you take one of our MOOCs, one of our massively open online courses, is, is you're getting um, the experience of sitting in on one of our classes. And so you're getting the opportunity to learn the material through lectures and through classroom assignments. But you're not uh, mastering the material to the level that we would confer course credit for. In order to do that, you need to do uh, more structured programming, deeper homeworks, machine problems, and pass uh, proctored examinations that are comprehensive. And so that's the difference between a MOOC, uh, kind of sitting in on a course with lectures and classroom assignments, and, um, and receiving course credit towards a degree that we would require. Um, so the next bullet is, um, how are the online MCS courses different than the Coursera MOOC courses? Uh, the online MCS courses consist of a lecture portion, um, the lecture and classroom assignments from two of our open uh, um, enrollment MOOCs uh, that anybody can take on the Coursera platform. So those two MOOCs together give you all the lectures and, and classroom assignments from one of our four credit courses. But in addition to that, you'll, you will um, have much more difficult homeworks, um, machine problems, programming assignments, um, tests, and, uh, and, and exams uh, that are proctored and uh, comprehensive uh, on the material. So there's a lot more assessment that goes into that, uh, along with those more difficult uh, uh, machine problems and examinations and everything else. Um, we will also provide you with access to teaching staff, teaching assistants, um, and, and office hours with the professor uh, teaching the class that will enable you to get the deeper uh, understanding of the material needed to get through that, uh, those more advanced assessments. Um, and so those, uh, those are some of the additional benefits you get from a full degree um, uh, of conferring uh, um, MCS course, as opposed to just the, the MOOC portion that has only the lectures. Okay. I think, did you kind of answer the next one? Do the two Coursera MOOC courses count for uh, credit? A little bit, yeah. So, um, so for example, if you take uh, uh, Cloud Computing Concepts 1 and Cloud Computing Concepts 2 on the Coursera platform, just as uh, uh, you can do it right now as a, as a Coursera learner, you're, you're getting the lectures from the Cloud Computing Concepts course, but you're not getting any of the more detailed uh, um, elements of the uh, credit bearing portion. So um, uh, if you complete those MOOCs, you don't have to sit through the same lectures. You don't have to even do the same classroom assignments, but you will need to complete all of the additional material when you take it for credit. Um, so uh, those uh, taking the Coursera MOOCs um, is like sitting in a class before you actually take the class, but we will count any, any work that you did for the MOOCs um, as part of the class. You'll just have to do additional work when you take the class for credit. And each of our four credit class consists of two MOOCs worth of lectures and classroom assignments, but the additional um, machine problems, programming, uh, exams, tests, and, and all the other assessments. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. Okay, next questions. Um, so I completed a Coursera specialization. Will I earn graduate credit um, at the University of Illinois? Uh, right, and the answer there is no. Um, none of those MOOC uh, courses, uh, which are equivalent to sitting in on a class, uh, confer any credit um, towards any degree. Um, what, what you have uh, received through the Coursera specialization are the lectures and some classroom assignments from our classes, but nowhere near the, uh, the projects, the machine problems, uh, assignments, and examinations needed for us to confer credit. Um, anything you did 
um, complete the classroom assignments and the lectures you listen to for that specialization uh, will count towards uh, your completion of the coursework associated with that, but you will need to do that additional material once you're admitted to the University of Illinois and you take that course for credit. Okay. Uh, next question, are students expected to be proficient in a particular programming language? Yeah, well, we expect students to be proficient in English, but for <laughs> programming languages, um, most students know Python, and we have a lot of material that's available in Python and in R. Um, it really helps to, to be proficient in one production language, either C++ or Java. So if you, haven't, uh, if you don't have experience with C++ or Java, then we recommend you pick up one of those two languages. Right. Um, let's see. What if my undergraduate oh, wait, wait. GPA? Uh, let me do the one above it. How do students apply for the online MCS or MCSDS? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a checkbox on the app, uh, on the application form that says, uh, uh, do you want to um, apply for the data sciences? Uh, Are you interested in the data science? Sorry, yes. yes. Yeah, the data science track. So it's just a track of courses. Um, the admissions criteria is the same for MCS or for MCSDS. Once you're admitted to the program, you can start on the MCSDS and change your mind and just take uh, more general classes that include software engineering or uh, programming languages and compilers or um, uh, parallel programming or numerical methods. Those are all outside of our data science track. You're welcome to take any of those classes or others and earn just a general MCS degree. Or if you started with the MCS degree and want to focus on data sciences, you can start taking classes in that data science track and complete uh, the degrees in the data science track. Um, in the application form, it helps if you check it off just so we know um, uh, what information to provide you so our advisors know how to best advise you for classes. But it's not contractual and it's all one program, just multiple ways of completing the program. And we will work with you, our advisors will work with you individually to make sure you're getting the appropriate classes for what you want to do with your degree. Okay, perfect. Okay, so next question. What if my undergraduate GPA is less than a 3.0? Um, so we will look at your, uh, uh, at all of your application. We apply holistic uh, evaluation uh, of, uh, of our graduate applications. So send us everything. Even if your GPA for all four years is less than 3.0, we'll look at the last two years of your GPA, your last two years of coursework. We will look at your uh, GPA of your computer science courses, your computing courses. Um, we'll also look at coursework you've taken after you received your bachelor's degree, um, uh, including just uh, uh, non-degree courses, courses just taken to learn. We'll look at, at everything and make the determination if we believe that you can succeed at the graduate level uh, in coursework in computer science at, uh, at the University of Illinois. Uh, what we don't want to do is we don't want to admit anybody um, and put them on a pathway that um, where we don't feel they have everything they need to succeed in the program. That's not good for the student. It's not good for everybody involved in the program. Um, so we want to make sure um, when we admit somebody, we admit them with uh, with the uh, support and belief that they can complete the program. Okay. Uh, next, we may also make recommendations on things um, that you can do to, uh, mm -hmm. to improve your application as well. So we'll, we'll be in touch if, if for some reason you don't get uh, admitted on the first try. Okay. Next question: Do international students um, receive an I twenty? Yes, please. So, um, and we get this question a lot, and we understand the question, the questioning behind it. Uh, this program is an online program. It is a 100% online program, so there is no requirement for the students to be on campus to complete the degree requirements. So given that for online programs, the university, this is in general, not just the MCS or the MCSDS online program, there are no I-20s issued for any of the online programs available on campus. So if, you're, if the, if the follow-up question is, how would this um, help me seek employment, then that would be based on an employment eligible visa, visa and um, working with an employer to get, that, get an eligible visa. So 
So the lack of an I-20 also means that um, students will not be able to do, for example, summer internships based on a CPT. If, if those who are asking about the I-20 would know what the CPD is in general, and I'm just giving that additional information. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, will non-degree students be able to take online MCS courses? And the answer is yes. We do have um, some of our courses available for non-degree um, uh, students, meaning you can take the courses individually without being um, um, uh, without uh, being admitted into the MCS program. But we still need all of the students that take these courses to have all of the prerequisite knowledge needed to get through the courses. So you would still have to have the same criterion needed to be admitted to the MCS uh, program to take the, uh, the courses even if you're a non-degree. Anything to add there? Nothing to add, okay. And then this next question was kind of addressed, is financial aid available for online MCS students? So the answer is yes, the, uh, the degree is fully accredited and uh, eligible for financial aid. Uh, and the answer is no, the, uh, that we do not have any financial aid available ourselves for students in this program. But uh, you're free to pursue options that may be available for you for financial aid for this program. And uh, you know, we'll do everything we can to support that, but we don't have any financial aid available for students in this program. Okay, and then the final question is, when will applications for the next admission cycle open? Vivica? <laughs> um, so we, we close this cycle of applications on February 15th, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and the next cycle should open immediately after yep. and um, summer for summer. Yep. And so for the, I'm sorry, like we're, we're, for taking, the summer, yeah, we're, we're taking, taking applications, applications now for the summer, for summer. For the summer admission. Right. And, and then for fall admission, it would open once these applications close. So if you, um, if you don't submit the application for summer, please do check back. And you can also, if you start the application now, it is going to remain in the system. So for any reason, if you decide that summer is maybe not going to work for you and you want to apply for a later semester, you can return to that same application that, that is not submitted yet mm -hmm. and continue to work on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, what we don't know is when the applications for the next admission cycle will close. close. That's, right. typic that has typically been in April, March or April? No, we've done it in, um, you, if you, Historically, the, uh, the fall admissions had closed in on May 30th. Okay, good. So, so you've got, so you've got, you've the got rest about of three months, two and a half months to yeah. apply for fall. But uh, mm -hmm. what you should really do is try to get your application in before February 15th. Um, and even if, you, even if you don't want to start your coursework in the summer, if you want to wait till fall, we can work with you to start you in the fall, even if your uh, application was submitted by the 15th. So the, the important thing is get your application in. Uh, that way, if there's some problem with your application, if you're missing some prerequisite, you've got time to address that, uh, perhaps in time to get in um, by the May deadline. Okay, perfect. Let's see, that concludes our FAQ, and this is the last slide for us. Um, so just some important links. Here's a link for the application um, that is available um, both on our website and um, from the Coursera website. Um, there are two program website links for the online MCS um, with more general courses, and then the MCSDS track. Um, requirements by country, I also shared this in the chat space. Um, so you can check and see what GPA requirement is for um, your institution, if TOEFL or IELTS is required, et cetera. Um, TOEFL and IELTS waiver information. So if you think you might qualify based on employment history, or if you've gone to a school um, where, um, you know, within the last five years and you think you are eligible for that, please confirm that information here. And then application deadlines, 
link. Um, this is both when the application should be submitted and when the decisions will go out. Um, all important links. So that concludes our slide deck. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Uh, we have several questions in the Q&A. Um, so I guess we'll just go start going through these if that works for you guys. Great. Okay, so first one, I'm just gonna start at the top. So Eugene is wondering, being a full-time worker, um, it can be difficult to attend a local college for the prere prerequisites. So I'm just wondering what my chances are of getting into the program with only taking MOOC courses for core concepts like data structures. Also, were there any specific MOOC courses we can recommend? Yeah. So we, we've looked at this in the past. It's always best to take a uh, college credit bearing course um, for these prerequisites because those have a grade associated with them. Those have uh, formal proctored exams and uh, that are comprehensive that we can rely on. Um, uh, when you complete a MOOC, um, it's, it's unclear, you know, if, if that contains the, the depth of, uh, um, of um, assessment that we typically look for. So we, we've considered those in the past, but uh, uh, those have been more on the, on the borderline of what we can allow. What you should take a look at though is keep an eye out. If you need something like data structures, we're in the process of rolling out a pilot uh, sequence of MOOCs that will satisfy that, um, followed by a formal proctored exam. And so we're in the process of making that pathway available to people exactly in your situation where you need an online option to fulfill some of these prerequisites. Um, so we're in the process of developing that. Just stay tuned through the spring semester and you'll see some uh, additional uh, uh, instructions on how you can get involved in, in doing that. But that, uh, that will be rolling out later on in the spring. And that was a question that was also yep. in the... Yep, yep. Yep, yep, I cleared that one out. Okay, next question. What is the acceptance rate when is the next cohort? And I don't think I can apply by February 15th. Okay. Acceptance rates around 30%. Um, and I think we answered the next cohort. Uh, right now, the uh, applications are due February 15th. Um, the next uh, set of applications, you can apply right after the 15th. Um, we will accept applications all the way up to uh, some point in May. And we haven't uh, we haven't locked down that date yet, so um, through the rest of the spring semester. Okay. So uh, I would like to tag on to that because there's a question in the um, Q&A session, mm -hmm. a follow-up question, is there a ratio of domestic to international students you look to meet? Nope. We do not have that. We, we do not uh, consider nation, uh, nation of origin in our admissions decisions. Um, mm -hmm. All of our admissions decisions are based on um, exactly what I said before. Um, we look at uh, the, um, the GPA, uh, the prerequisite courses, and the fact that you have a bachelor's degree, and, and that's really it. So um, we do not, uh, we don't have any targets, and we don't uh, take into account uh, domestic students or international students or any nation of origin. Okay. Next question. How do you usually receive the GPA from countries that don't use it? Is it something that the college university where you got your bachelor's degree usually does or an external company needs to be hired for that? We do not need an external company to be hired and sometimes we do see applications where um, they, this information will be provided by a third party um, company and that is that is not going to be really revealed. We at the department and the graduate college do, we do our own internal evaluations based on the information that is provided on your transcripts. So do not uh, pay for a third party company to do that for you, but make sure that you give us the complete set of transcripts, including the grading scale, and we will do that work for you if you do not have a GPA posted. Yep. Yep. And these guys are world experts in this, in this matter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question. If we haven't taken a data structures course in algorithms in undergrad, can we meet the requirement by taking an online course? Uh, yeah, but stay tuned. Um, we'll probably filter you in the one that we're preparing specifically for the degree program. That'll be the best.